What's up, everybody? Welcome to Security Squawk Live. <laughs> We're finally here together um, in, where are we, Charlotte? Charlotte, yeah. Yeah. Und Undisclosed uh, location in North America. All right. Okay, I'm the mic guy. So this is very ad hoc for us. We are not used to doing this um, live, so we're trying to figure this out. We stole a hotel room, uh, a conference room. And so we may get kicked out at some point. Yeah, we, may, we may just end the show abruptly, so we, we're just winging it here. So we're going to talk about uh, today a little bit uh, about what we've been doing here in Charlotte, um, some of the stuff that's happening in the world around cybersecurity, um, probably won't be a normal 45 minute an hour show, but we'll, uh, be a normal show by any means. we'll figure it out. But, um, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about is, uh, we, we got, we were fortunate enough to spend some time with, uh, the ex CISA director, Chris Krebs, which if you're in cybersecurity, this is somebody that you know, and is well known. Um, and then we'll just wrap about some, some issues and some, some cyber attacks are in the news, but. I, I think, show. yeah, I think Andre should tell us. He does it the best. This show is free, 99. There is no cost. All we just ask is that you like, you subscribe, and most importantly, you share this. If you are a um, maybe a C level human resource person or somebody that you know you can pass this along to and just say, hey, listen to this show. These guys were talking about some very important information that we should do in our company. That's all we ask for. All right. I think one of the, the, the things, just to roll right into it, that I, I thought was really cool um, talking to Chris Krebs yesterday was just how down to earth he was. Mm -hmm. um, very personable uh, to, to speak with. One of the, the, the biggest things he said when, when he was doing his talk, though, that I thought was really interesting was uh, that those of us in this community that are, are protecting small businesses uh, are basically part of the national security infrastructure at this point because of what we're doing. And I, I thought that was a really powerful statement. Yeah, I've uh, thought about that before. That was that was really good. Talking about how basically it's kind of like like in World War II, like the entire country, even if you didn't go off to fight, mm -hmm. you were still part of the quote unquote war effort. Yeah, you know. Um, and I've thought about that before. That's a that's a great point. Where you know, not doing your part could put your business at, at risk, could put the economy at risk, could put uh, trade secrets mm -hmm. at risk, or whatever. Um, that was a really really good. Uh, Really good point that he made. Another thing that we talked a little bit about too that um, uh, was a question that I asked him was how do we spread the awareness right now? Because you know we've talked about this on the show. Um, you know the the average small business owner just doesn't think this is real. They don't think that this exists, and um, I, I don't know that we had any real good ideas on how to accomplish that. But he absolutely agreed. You know we need to find a way to destigmatize this and, and, and make it so people are willing to talk about it. You know, whether you're doing security or not, it's inevitable, you know, you're going to have some sort of attack. Um, you know, having security in place is going to reduce the impact of that attack, but everybody's going to get hit. So removing the stigma of that and just realizing it's going to happen to you. So it's not embarrassing when it does share that knowledge that people understand that. He, he literally had a saying that he said, it was like, there's two kinds of businesses in the world. Those, what did he say? Those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked? And those like, don't realize that they are. <laughs> yeah. One of the things he said was, you know, there's a lot of business people out there that don't understand that they're in the game, in the cybersecurity game. And it's as simple as, as this. If you have email, you're in the game. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to protect that. You have to defend that. On the battlefield, I think, was, was the, the term that he used. Right. Yeah. And he's like, a lot of business owners don't realize that they're on the playing field yeah. right now, and they don't think that they are. So, But unfortunately, one of the sad things he did say is that, you know, he doesn't see the current administration or the, the, the next set of lawmakers that's going to be coming in the Senate making any changes. So no real improvement. And as we all know, as business owners, if things start from the top. If it's not from the top and trickling down, then no one else is going to do it. So that's that was one of the, you know, real things he did say that it was, you know, kind of unfortunate as well. I, I would add that that's, that was kind of a relief because we've talked about a lot. Um, in our in our podcast about wanting or that we need more, you know, government. We've also talked about how if they do get involved, how it could make it even more difficult uh, because sometimes government doesn't always 
you know, do things the best. Yeah, Didn't he say he lost his mind after he got yeah, worked to the government? Yeah, it, 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 anytime the, the <laughs> government regulation came up, he kind of had a little chuckle to it. But I, I think the gist of it was that, that you know, regulation is, is probably needed. Uh -huh. It's just the, there's not a whole lot of faith that the regulation that is going to get put forth is going to be right. adequate or something that's going to going to even work. So. We, uh, we talked a couple of weeks or about three podcasts ago about um, some regulations that were put out from, uh, I think it was in New York uh, mm -hmm. Securities, mm -hmm. yeah. which, um, you know, that was one particular industry, but I just remember liking how much was on there and how good it was. I think that's well, pretty Well, he good. mentioned that too. I think he, he referenced uh, the, the security, the SEC type security and how that, that seems to be a, a playbook that is, is showing success and showing that it's, it's, it's working, so... Yeah, I mean, he he did he hit, he touched on that. He touched on regulated industries, you know, energy sector, financial sector. Um, but yeah, I think I agree with him on the fact that big, the the big moves that the federal government needs to make are going to take a long time. Um, people don't understand this stuff, and the people that do, what I guess the biggest takeaway I had yesterday is. We need to play a bigger part. And that does mean, right. like, you know, for me, I can jump on a train and be in Washington in an hour and a half, you know. And, like, I you know it's not as easy for you guys. But, you you know, you can go to your congressmen. You can go to your senators. And you can, you know, we're, we're obviously putting ourselves out there on this podcast as experts. And, you know, that's, you know, the next thing I'm going to try to figure out is, you know, develop a relationship with some of my New Jersey congressmen to let them know I'm a resource. When you start seeing these bills, come call me and I'll help you understand what these things mean. Um, because I think a lot of lawmakers are afraid to make any moves because it's something they just don't understand. Yeah, that, was, so. that was something he mentioned also, just lawmakers not understanding, yeah. you know, the whole the whole picture. I know you had a Oh, no, he, he, uh, Brian touched on it, but he did also say they do want to hear from us. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was something because, but then he also then said, but then from there, when it comes to then special interests, lobbyists, whatever you try to put may get watered down, but at least from the top, it, it started oh, good, right, but right. then it just, you know, oh. special interest comes in. Yeah, another, another thing I thought was really interesting was uh, he, he mentioned kind of our role as uh, service providers in this space, uh, and that in his opinion, every business needs to have what we, we offer, right? To be able to control that, you know, to the very point that they are on the on the playing field, uh, whether they, they want to believe it or not. Right. Um, so I thought that was really powerful too, because I mean, how often do we talk to people who are like, you know, I'm just a small business. I don't, I don't need this kind of thing. And, you know, we, we've seen based on what's going on out there that that's, that's not the case. And again, it goes back to, uh, you know, sharing that knowledge and education and destigmatizing it. Right. Because, you know, I still, I still believe anytime a business owner tells me, I don't know anybody who's been hacked. I'm willing to bet you do. They just haven't talked about it. They're not right. sharing that knowledge. They, you know, they went right. through something and, it, it, you know, they, they, whether it's embarrassing or what have you, you know, they're just not talking about it. And, and, you know, I think businesses should share that information to help people so that they don't have to go through that. Right. I mean, it's critical that businesses share this information. It's unfortunate that that's where we're at right now is that people, you know, businesses don't want to admit to it. They feel shame. They feel embarrassed. Um, not any different to any crime that, you know, there's a victim, you know, there's other crimes where, you know, people are victims and they don't want to talk about it, but that can't be the stigma with this. Um, Cause it's a team sport. We're not going to, Individually, we're not going to win this war. It, we're going to have to work together to try to, you know, combat this. But he also said yesterday that this is going to be, as long as there's technology, this is going to be something that we have to deal with. All the, I, I think there's people out there that think one day there's going to be like this, you know, condom that goes over the internet and everybody's going to be safe and, and secure. That's not ever going to happen. You, you, if you think that that's a reality, you just don't understand how technology works because breaches can happen at so many different levels. He got into like the hardware level yesterday and like, but you know, he, he did say, Chris said straight up, his biggest fear is software vulnerabilities over mm -hmm. any kind of hardware, right? And software think about all the different programming languages out there and how software can be created. And that's kind of where he's going with that thought. I mean, we just had the big one with Apple uh, last week, the week before. I mean, that, that stuff's happening really 
often now. Um, one of the other things, kind of going back to the, the the comment about you know there's there's two types of businesses, right? We actually I don't, I don't know if you guys had talked to this gentleman, but uh, there, there's a guy here at the, at the conference that we're at um, who had a situation where he he had an existing client um, that you know and he he's just getting into you know making the the, the transition from a support focus to a security focus, and so he started doing uh, an assessment on this this existing client and like a couple days into the assessment realized somebody's been in their 365 account for mm. who knows how long. Mm. So it, it's, it's true. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're either, you've either been hacked or you, you have, you're, you're, you just don't know it yet. Right. They had somebody in their, in their system and he's dealing with this active while we're in here. So it's, it's, uh, you, you really have to watch out for this kind of stuff right now. I mean, mm -hmm. again, it, just having security doesn't mean you're immune. It's still going to happen, but you can really reduce the impact on, on, how bad it is. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything, I mean, that, that was kind of the, the thing that we were talking about. You don't know at this point, you know, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's in there, but you don't know what they've touched. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you know what they may have taken out. Mm -hmm. You don't know what type of access they have at this point. So, and it's kind of security 101 mm -hmm. to assume that they're already there yep. um, and then segment everything. So, you know, maybe they did get into a 365 account, but they don't have admin rights, right. you know, or, you know, or whatever, just to keep them, uh, keep them in. Another topic that um, he talked about is how does the government do as far as playing well with each other? And one of the suggestions that he gave is that there just needs to be one agency that focuses on emails because um, or email management for Office 365, because you have all of these diff different departments with different guidelines. And some may have it on, have two form factor on. Some may have this on and off and things like that. And they're not playing as a team. So why don't you just have one? body, one agency that just takes care of it across the board. And then that way you don't have these type of um, fun builds. Yeah, and that also goes with just buying, buying the licenses. They're buying, you know, all these different departments are hiring companies to buy these licenses when if they could just come together, I'm sure they could go direct to Microsoft and get a better deal for the taxpayers. Because that's the other thing he brought up. When you're talking about defending, you know, it's in the government. This doesn't apply to government. This applies to all businesses. But when you're talking about defending your data and keeping things secure, you got to pay for it, right? <clears throat> so businesses, it's either going to come from increased prices or you're going to take a hit on your profit. Government has to pay for it through tax dollars. So the American taxpayer is, is going to have to fund all these things that we talk about on this show all the time. So it's not an easy challenge. It's not going to be solved overnight, but that's kind of where we're at. That's the, the lay of the land and where we're at right now. But um, <clears throat> I'm going to sound super biased here, but, you know, we are, as MSSPs, the, the most equipped in all of business and all of government to help with this problem. You know, we are specializing our companies, our team members on, you know, how to handle this stuff. And we have the expertise and we have the manpower to help, you know, these IT departments that don't have there who are struggling with wrapping their head around how they're going to, they don't even know what to do first off. And then once they figure out what they actually have to do, then they're going to have to figure out how they're going to do it. Right. And that's when they need to turn to companies like ours. Cause we're, we've been doing this for years, more than three years, five years, six years, seven years, where other companies are just starting to figure this out, right? And they, they, Chris said it yesterday, and I've said this for a long time, they need to tap into our companies like ours to solve this problem. Now, not all MSSPs are created the same. We all know this. So, you know, that's a challenge for these companies to figure out who they should be working with. But, um, you know, that's where I see this going. I see a huge opportunity for companies like ours to help not only private businesses, but, but governments with this challenge. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I know we have a lot of business owners that watch our show and a lot of businesses that already have IT departments and it's unrealistic. Yeah, I'm, I, most IT people are probably amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just unrealistic though to expect that IT guy to stay up on top of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's just too much to stay up yep. with. Um, so it's a it's a good opportunity, um, you know, be sure to let him know he's awesome, but it's also a good opportunity to bring in um, a company that knows how to deal with the security, um, you know, like in a co-managed situation yeah. or something like that, 
to help out to make sure that the company is uh, protected. I'm sure the IT guy would really appreciate it. Yeah, I, probably I think, more than anything. I think that's important. Is is the the IT guys these days? Most of them are going to be receptive to that kind of thing because they realize they're not equipped to handle that. Um, you know, it's one thing to keep up with everything that's going on and how quickly it's changing. It's a t completely different beast to go from, you know, your knowledge from a support focus to a security focus. I mean, we've all gone, <clears throat> excuse me, we've all gone through that, but how long did it take to do that? It's not something that you can transition to overnight. It's it's a, a process where you have to, to, you know, get up to date on all the policies and, and frameworks and, and and understand how to to solve for those controls. So it's not something that an IT guy can wake up in the morning and go, hey, I'm going to do security today. Yeah, it just doesn't work that way. It's like taking your plane while it's flying, and right? Make it into a jet. So yeah, I think I think a lot of the IT guys, because I've talked to many of them, that, you know, that's that's just their comfort zone. That's what they want to do, and that's that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that, and that that's where we're going to see, I think, a shift over the next five or six years to where you're going to have, you know, those those IT uh, support focused companies, and that's what they do, mm -hmm. and then they they either work in conjunction with or. Uh, we work in conjunction with them to where we're providing the security layer mm -hmm. uh, to their support layer. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's really ultimately a more efficient way of doing things anyway. Mm -hmm. But it has to be trust because that IT guy is looking and saying they're looking at our website and they see help desk support and cybersecurity and all these things. And then from there, they're like, these guys are going to come in, learn everything and then give a proposal, to take, take away my salary and take away my job. So I think we have to make sure that when we do go in there, it's like, look, we really don't want to do help desk. You can have that. You can run around and, you know, do like that. Just let us do your security. It's um, honestly, it's even better for us on the margin side. Yeah. I mean, but, and I also look at it like what you just said is you, that's, you also need the whole entire organization to buy in to, right. it can't be just the IT guy. It can't be just the CFO. It has to be the C-suite plus the IT department. The buy-in has to happen at a lot of different levels, and that's where you're going to have success because it should be a partnership. It shouldn't. No one should feel threatened by you know outsourcing expertise somewhere else because it's got to get done. Um, you're either just not going to do it. <clears throat> um, so, are you guys familiar with what happened over at Twitter, like the guy, the blue whistleblower thing? Because I think that's a good kind of segue into a, a deeper discussion about. You know, probably what's happening a lot out there today. So if, if people don't know what I'm referring to, um, there was a guy, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, but a well-known guy and a respected Oh, very well-known uh, ethical, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ethical hacker. And he was hired by Twitter after, if people remember, um, Twitter was hacked. They their help, One of their employees um, thought a help desk guy was calling them. And you let him into this. I took yeah. a picture. <laughs> and uh, that they they were basically able to trick the person into getting into the Twitter systems, and then they were able to take over like Obama's account and Elon Musk's account, and post a Bitcoin address saying like, "Hey, I'm giving away. If you send me X amount of Bitcoin, I'm going to send you ten times back or whatever." You know, um, and that was in the news. So they brought this guy in after that happened to shore up their security, and <clears throat> he came in and did what we got we do we do an assessment right and we tell companies mm. here's all the things that you know are going to cause you to get hacked mm. and one of the things he identified which is very common in my assessments is companies that have very old infrastructure mm. <clears throat> infrastructure that's so old that there's no patch for the vulnerabilities that exist on them um and he pointed this out not only did he point it out but he was pushing twitter to do something about this. Ultimately, he ended up getting fired as a result, which that's kind of where I want to stop the conversation about that story. And then we can pick up mm. kind of where things are at right now. But geez, like that blew my mind. Like yeah. the CEO of a major uh, social media company. Mm -hmm. I mean, this wasn't a low level position. He was the CISO for Twitter yeah. and he's doing his job. And when I read this, I just thought to myself, like, how, wow, like, I wonder how many clients of my company look at us that way. Like, these guys always coming at us, like, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. Um, and, and, and twofold, you know, we're getting it from two sides. We obviously can do our, our assessments from an infrastructure and a security standpoint, but you also have 
you know, third party risk assessments coming in. Like, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Cyber insurance questionnaires. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? And then we got to go to these CEOs and say, you're not doing this stuff. So it's either you tell your, your client who's giving you a third party risk assessment, or you tell your cyber insurance company that you're not doing these things. That's your choice, right? It's your choice to not do these things. And you, but, are you, and you know, you, obviously you don't want to lie, it, uh, not to say it doesn't happen, but it does. But that's kind of the, like, I want to get your guys' opinion and thoughts on what I'm talking about here because it just blows my mind here that CEOs are taking the position that, like, we're the enemy. Like, right. we're the bad guy here. I would argue that it's happening to us right now. Yeah. Because when you go and you do that, what does the client either say, let's do it, or you're fired, you're too expensive. I'm going to find somebody else. And then they go with the cheaper guy that doesn't care and just, just doing the, the bare minimum. The only difference is it's not a whistle, whistleblower case. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think, too, the, the, the Twitter situation and, and kind of where we see this as well, is it, it's because we'll, we'll even get it when we get buy-in. So, like, you know, we, we sign up a new company and, and, and we're providing these services for them. And they liked the fact that we were providing the security. You know, everything on paper looks really good. Yes, we've got security. We're really mm -hmm. proud of that. But then, you know, the minute it causes any type of, yep. of uh, delay in, in them being able to do stuff, you know, uh, CEOs, owners in mm -hmm. particular, oh, well, I, I just want that for everybody else. I, I want my yeah. full admin right so I can, you know, do whatever I want and install right. this, you know, goofy, goofy game that, to play uh -huh. while I'm on lunch. Um, and I think that's kind of what looks like happened in Twitter's case. So like they had this high profile security issue. Mm -hmm. So they bring on a high profile security guy that looks really good to the shareholders, but then they don't take any of his advice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that ultimately looks like what, what happened with it. And I was reading an interesting story talking about kind of the, the hierarchy of, of a CISO. And, and, and we've talked about this on the show before, um, you know, the CISO shouldn't be reporting to the CTO. Because the CTO is, yep, is the one right. who's, who's supposed that's to right. keep the, the, the wheels that's moving, right. whereas the CISO is trying to you know, put in security right. things that are going to maybe slow things down. You know, right. Sometimes security is inconvenient. Um, and, and the story was kind of getting to the point where you know, the, the, the CISO needs to report to at least the CEO, but if not that, like probably more right. like the board, because right. the, they need to know what, what these things are right. to make those decisions. Because, you know, again, the CEO is supposed to make, make sure that he's doing the right job to make sure that that, that share price yep. goes up. and. Security can stop that, but a security incident can cause an even bigger problem too. Uh, the, the crazy, the crazy thing is, he said, um, "Well, and it came out in the report that mm -hmm. the, the whistleblower said that highly likely a, a foreign operative operative." Mm -hmm. Can I say that right? Wasn't it multiple? It's, it wasn't just yeah, one. at least yeah. one, maybe two, are are, liter are literally lead, helping to lead the mm -hmm. company, um, and you know. The, I don't know if you want to get into this at all, but Chris mentioned yesterday, this will be your call, but he just mentioned that there, there needs to be some kind of regulation mm -hmm. on a company that is a, you know, um, such a platform, you know, that they're screwing around on their security. Yeah. Foreign operatives are, are, you know, we're talking like, like you know, government uh, spies from yeah. other company, companies, um, other countries, sorry, are involved, like, it's kind of disturbing to think of all the data they have on us yeah. and all the conversation that goes on. Well, and he didn't, and he didn't directly connect the dots either, but then he also at another point was talking about the, the impact of disinformation uh -huh. uh, globally. And so uh -huh. that, that's a big concern. Like if you uh -huh. get somebody who gets into a system or a platform like Twitter, I mean, you, you've got like uh -huh. you know, a world stage to spread uh -huh. whatever information or disinformation you want. And that, that can be really damaging. He, he uh, actually uh, recommended a book um, about that. We probably ought to post it on the link or whatever, but just about Russian di disinformation over yep. the last like hundred years or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, very, very interesting that he brought yep. that up, yep. um, at the end. That's so. what I said. Like, he didn't really connect the dots directly, but I, I, I saw where he was going with it. So Actually, he's talking crazy like Brian Hornick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it begs a question and I don't, I, I'm just going to throw it out there and I'll give you my opinion after I ask it. But you know, in this situation, this guy, you know, went and told the FTC, and this is why he's a, a whistleblower, uh, that Twitter's not doing things above board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at certain clients that we have, and, you know, I like I said, I have 
a little bit of fear that we might lose clients because we're just trying to do the right thing. Right. And they get somebody to come in the door that says, oh, you don't need to be doing all that. That's overkill, which I would completely debate and disagree with that person on. But that's their opinion. They're a professional. That's like why people go to multiple doctors if they have a major medical issue, right? One doctor says this and go get a second opinion, right? That's going to happen in our industry. People are going to get second opinions and it's going to be different than what maybe we've recommended. It's not going to be consistent. Um, so that begs the question, if that ever happened to me, or if it ever happened to you guys, would you whistleblow? Would you go to, like I think of clients that we work with when they get, they get third-party risk assessments from major corporations. Would you go to, like if I got fired from a client because I was just trying to do the right thing and I knew this company was lacking in security, I don't think I would wait one second to go to that company and tell them they have major gaps here and they're relying on their third-party risk assessment. Yeah. I would do it. I'm not sure if I would or not. I need to think about that for a minute. You mean like go public with it or no, go to like a regular? go to the company. For and, sure, go to the company. Yeah. And privately disclose. Uh -huh. For sure, would do that. On. For sure, would do that. Yeah. So you're not talking necessarily about going to an agency? I or... would never, never put anybody on blast in public for yeah. something like Because then you're just saying to the hackers, like, right. go here. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't do that. Right. Well, it's the same thing as like disclosing a vulnerability <laughs> right. you know, publicly so you know, before the, the, the company has had a chance to. But I, I I've had a situation that was that was similar to that where I did. Thank you. I, <laughs> that's why I was holding it because you use your hands right? and stuff when you talk. I do. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I had a situation where I did an assessment for a prospect, and and you know when I was was putting the results together, like it it was bad. Like it was it was really mm. really bad to the point where I was starting to question, you know, because of the nature of the type of business it was, you know, if they got breached, because because. I had a pretty good suspicion that right. they were going to not move forward with right. it. You know, they didn't, they didn't, wow. they were very serious about security, obviously, because it was so bad. Um, so I had to run it through my attorney just to make sure I was like, you know, wow. this is this bad. Like, I don't want this to come blow back on me. You know, it, it, it's not a situation where I'm going to publicly disclose, like we uh -huh. just talked about, but you know, I did my best to let them know where all of these shortcomings were and, and what type of, um, you know, attack vectors, they were wide open to, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they just didn't care. You know? mm -hmm. And and so I had to run it through my attorney. You know, is this something where if they got hit and, and all of their customers' data was leaked because I'm aware of this now, how bad this is, you right. know, it's going to blow back on me. So right. it's, it's scary. It'd probably be good to have your attorney look over your statement of work mm -hmm. that you have them sign before you do the whole yep. assessment. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. Unless I'm required by law or, you know, during the assessment, you see something like, you know, child porn or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. But if if I don't have to, I think I would just say, hey, you didn't hire me. Here's your report. What if it was a client and you knew them really well? Right. And you knew them well and, so, and you, you got fired because you were just trying to do the right thing and you know this company doesn't do the right thing. I'm not saying they didn't hire you. I'm saying right. you, they were your client and they fired you. You wouldn't you wouldn't go to whoever and kind of say, "Hey, things aren't really on the up and up here." So I've had that, um, and I would say at least two times. You know, Windows seven computers that they said just we're going to do it, give us time, we're going to get the money. But then at the same time, they're redoing their lobby and they got plenty of money for that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then from there, I kind of said you know, that's it. I can't do it. This is your new price. And then they said no. And then I just left and yep. that was it. But no, I didn't go back, even though I knew some of the board members and things like that, but you fired me or let me go or whatever. So that's it. And I think that's a different philosophy that, that many of us have. Everybody wants to hold the microphone for me. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a philosophy that we have that, that a lot of other people in our space don't necessarily have right now. And, and where we're ahead of the curve where, you know, we feel that it's our responsibility uh, to to inform business owners of, of what's going on, what risks that they have, what things that they can do to protect themselves, you know, and and I think most of us have taken the stance to where if the business owner isn't going to see that, then it's it's just not a fit to work together, you know, and it's okay. They have to make their own business decision for themselves, but it's it's our responsibility to give them the information to make that. So I'm just going to wrap this kind of Twitter conversation up with. Uh, the whistleblower anyway, is the fallout has yet to be seen from this. So in a couple of months, I'd like to know if our perspectives have changed, right? Because 
I do think that this will be one of the first cases where we see a whistleblower, an IT guy kind of saying like, hey, I'm just trying to do the right thing here. And this, and Twitter's executive board didn't. And not only I think the FTC will come down hard on Twitter as a result of this, but I think the SEC will also come down hard mm -hmm. on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I think some people are going to lose mm -hmm. their jobs, mm -hmm. like well, without I, a doubt. I just saw this morning that uh, they're, they're bringing them into to DC to uh, um, uh, to, to speak to one of the committees, the congressional committees, uh, I saw another story too, you know, just another layer that had, had come out that something like more than 50% of the employees at Twitter had some sort of privileged access that they shouldn't have had. I mean, that's, that's a lot of privileged access. Oh my gosh. Right? But that being said, I go back to, I immediately thought of the, the, the uh, Hillary Clinton server situation, mm -hmm. right? And why I believe that really didn't pick up as much steam as it merited is because I think there was a lot of Congress people looking around saying, oh, yep. shit, I got a server in that. a basement. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. I, and I'm just afraid that when these, this shit starts to hit the fan with this, that these congressional people mm -hmm. now I don't think regulators will. But I think when lawmakers hear this stuff, they're going to go, well, I, I mean, I have admin rights. I demand admin yeah. rights for my IT support person, company, right. you know, and the people just have to be educated as to why this stuff, why we do the things that we do, which seem restrictive, but there's a reason for it. It's a culture thing. I mean, yeah. people, people need to realize, you know, yes, I was talking to somebody else about this this morning, you know, uh, talking more about uh, access to data, right? So you know, how often do we talk to owners and they're like, well, you know, it's my company. I need access to everything. I understand that. So. Can you have access to everything? Yes, you're the owner, right? The buck stops at you. Should you? Do you need to access this file? Do you do anything with this on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis? Right. No, then you don't need access to it. If you ever did need access to it, let us know. We'll give it to you. But otherwise, you're just, you know, if your account got hacked, you're giving them access to way more than they need anyway. And I, I think that's a culture thing that people need to understand. Um, you know, yes, you can have access to it, but if you don't need it right now, you shouldn't. And, and that needs to be how people understand things. Yeah, and my, my, my concern, um, going off of what you said, is that the media won't thoroughly investigate it um, mm -hmm. like they should and keep, keep raising awareness about it, um, you know, because, I mean, I don't want to get into politics and all that, but it just seems like media is just kind of snoozing right now on the job about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like a lot of big tech and media are kind of working together and all this stuff. And, you know, not getting the word out and like that, that would be a horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and how this relates, I think, to small businesses, I mean, going back to your original question, I mean, yeah, one company might choose to not get secure, mm -hmm. but like, like, like we deal with a lot of construction companies mm -hmm. and they send, you know, they're sending invoices and payments and all this kind of stuff going around. Mm -hmm. Every business is like that. So it's not just them saying, oh, we don't want to be secure. When they choose to do that, they're affecting all of, right. all of their clients. You know, all of their vendors um, potentially um, are opening up to, uh, to risk. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what this means is, in, in, in layman's terms, just looking at the Twitter situation, think about all the data that Twitter has harvested on individuals based on what they post or what they like and what they view. And these vulnerable, these types of things, these, and them not maintaining their hardware standards, maintaining their security standards, can all lead to a breach. And people need to understand the amount of data and what they collect and how it's collected, and and, and that's all on you. And are you okay with that as an individual? Like, are you okay with, you know, a, a company that you you sign up for an account? You you are. I don't think people realize like when they like something or they comment on something, like how that correlates on the back end and, and figuring out who you are as a person and how they do things like target ads to you and things like that. That's the intended purpose of it. But let's think about all the things that can be done with that data from an unintended purpose, like, the doing on the back end that you don't know like when a hacker or a nation state yeah. gets a hold of that. Right. So that's this that's the concern i have and I, you know i just think that people need to be more conscious of you know who they're giving their data to and 
really demand that companies do the right thing around security. Like mm. I think Chris said it yesterday and I, and I've mentioned it on the show when it was just me and Andre, I think, right. The UL listed, right. Like UL approved, like any electrical product you plug into the wall, if it's legit, you know, and you didn't buy it from China or something is UL listed. It means it met a certain standard. Well, right now we don't have the standard no, set. Yeah, There's right. no standard set right now. So we got to get there and then we can have some body that kind of says, okay, this company is meeting these standards. And yeah, you can have a sock too. I'm sure Twitter has a sock too, but that's, that doesn't mean they're, they're protecting your security. It means they have cameras and locks on the doors basically and policies and procedures in place. Right. Well, I think it goes back to the, to the destigmatization. Oh, sorry, I just, no, the microphone no, no, was no, no, no. <laughs> trying to be efficient here. But destigmatizing this with people, mm -hmm. like like the more people understand that this is happening, the more open they are going to be to protecting those types mm -hmm. of things. But like to the point of, you know, we're not seeing uh, a whole lot of pushback on certain issues because other people are mm -hmm. doing that same thing and they don't want it. To, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's just too much sweeping under the rug right mm -hmm. now uh, to where you know everybody's just waiting. You know. It, with this idea that it's not going to happen to them, that this is mm -hmm. some sort of like lottery situation mm -hmm. where you know, uh, in reverse, you know, instead of being lucky and winning the jackpot, you're going to be the, the unlucky winner of, you know, getting a breach. Mm -hmm. and, and I think destigmatizing that to where people are more open and honest about mm -hmm. it will get people to be more open to, to, mm -hmm. Oh, Hey, you're right. That's a bad idea. Let's, let's fix that. Mm -hmm. Good point. But going back to the sweeping under the rug, what I see is going to happen is Twitter is going to pay a crazy, you know, $30 million fine, change uh, pocket change for them. There's going to be mm -hmm. a couple of executives that are going to, you know, get fired. And then six months later, they work for, you know, one of the good old boys agency or somebody else. And then that's it. But unless it becomes criminal mm -hmm. where someone's going to go to jail, then I think that's going to, that's when it's really going to matter. And people are really going to start to say, we have to take this seriously because I'm not going to spend, you know, two years right. in jail or federal prison just for that. that. That's also a terrible example to set. Like a, a big company like Twitter is going to be able to get away with that, but a small business, you don't have the cash flow to recover from that and, and mm -hmm. just pay the fine and move on. So right. you, you, that that's where we really need to get together and kind of, yeah, I think the, the SMB space is just totally different at this point. Mm -hmm. We kind of got to treat it that way. Right. You, you made a great point there, and I think that that's how we, as regulators and the government, should look at how they punish people in these situations. Like, instead of giving them a huge fine, make make them publicly disclose their cybersecurity risk mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. and, and I look at it like when you, when you go for government contracts right now, if you're a defense contractor, your cybersecurity might not be up to par, but you have to put a POAN, which is a plan, in place it says you're going to meet these things by a certain date well that's what these companies should be required to do if they get called out on the rug don't find them don't fire you, know, you can fire ceos if you want but let's not treat this the way we treat you know um uh, you know insider trading with stocks you know what i mean Tr treat this like hey this is a problem you have and you need to fix it so we're going to require you to publicly disclose where you're at with cybersecurity standards. We know we can go in and we can provide services like run a risk assessment and give them a report and give them a score on, on where their maturity is at. And that's where I think this needs to go. Like don't money grab, the, the federal government shouldn't money grab for $30 million. They should say, take your $30 million and go improve your right. security. And that's right. how we tackle But that's the, so, other, the other problem with it though is, is so, so you've got a company that's that large where those fines don't mean anything to them. It's just the cost of doing business. But at the same time, there's the other side of the equation where mm -hmm. in order to, to enact legislation to do what we're talking about right here, you know, they have to they have to do it. They have to get past those lobbyists. So not only are they paying the fines when, when they have the problem, but they're paying the lobbyists to make sure that those laws to enforce those things and punish them don't get enacted. So it, it and, and that's, again, why to me, you, you have to treat the SMB space and those big companies just completely separate because the SMBs are just getting lost in the mix because they think that that's, that's how you do business. And then they, they don't know until it's too late. It's interesting because we have, we have a little uh, uh, pros and cons uh, going on right here because <laughs> You know, you mentioned um, legality and you mentioned, you know, uh, action um, and it's not the same as insider trading. But part of me disagrees with that because, yeah, it's not insider trading, but they're still being all willy nilly with people's data. 50 yep. percent of the employee. 
I'm, I'm so mad right now. I'm holding it back. But 50% of the employees with privileged access, yeah. that's, that's freaking insane. That really is. And it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy, especially, you know, how Twitter as a corporation mm -hmm. gets so preachy and uppity and, and I'm, I'm don't gonna, even get me started on I'm that. I'm going to take a while, guess, and say <laughs> most of those employees are not all in the U S which yeah, is even yeah, scary. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. So, you know, I'm kind of on the fence on that. If, if, if there should be, uh, you know, criminal action. I think um, there absolutely on top should be. I just don't have, I don't have confidence that, that something like that's going to get enacted anytime soon. Right. All right. So the moral of the story is if you're a CEO and you think you're going to bully around your, your IT team, your security team, um, I think this is going to be a big lesson learned that you're, you don't have as much power here as you, you think mm -hmm. you might. And I think, you know, that's going to be, a big thing for businesses to grapple with that they actually have to deal with this problem. It might be in five years, it might be in 10 years, but mm -hmm. it's going to happen and they're going to mm -hmm. have to deal with it. And there's going to be, as Andre said, there's going to be criminal, you know, back, you know, criminal charges right. that, that could happen if, if you don't do this stuff. Mm -hmm. This is by no means the exception to the rule either. This, this is just the current high profile so thing. The the iceberg, news, right? Man. There's, there's many other companies right now that are probably doing this exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And then they're just waiting for that opportunity or uh, mm -hmm. opportunity, but that situation where they get caught and then they pay their fine and then they move and, back on. Right? So it's, and Randy just said it like, and Randy's frustrated. And I think, there's a lot of frustration among security professionals mm -hmm. right now. That's why this guy did what he did. He mm -hmm. whistleblowed. I can tell you I'm friends with guys that find vulnerabilities all the time and mm -hmm. they bang their head against the wall because they mm -hmm. get no response from companies. Mm -hmm. And, and I think like, it's just the frustration is going to bubble up so much that eventually it's going to hit the fan and mm -hmm. things aren't going to, be brushed under the rug, right? You know, it's the best way I can say it, like mm -hmm. they have in the past. Well, one of the other things that, that Chris talked about yesterday was was uh, kind of the impact that um, uh, people who are into incident response are running into. So they're constantly, you know, their their job, their speciality is to go in and, and, and recover oh. from situations like mm -hmm. this. So they're essentially the, the, the firemen of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. And they're getting burnt out because mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't have like, you know, nine to five. They have to run and jump when, when these tough. things happen. It is tough. And there's not enough of them. And and, it, and it's like then, then you have all of these companies that are basically, you know, smoking cigarettes in bed and falling asleep and lighting the place on fire. And these these firemen have to keep going out and putting these things mm -hmm. in. How frustrating is that mm -hmm. got to be when you're you're overworked? You got to work all these mm -hmm. times and then nobody cares and mm -hmm. they, they just keep doing it. And, mm -hmm. and that's going to burn those people out and, and they're going to get out of the industry. We're going to have even less people. To, right. To there's our, there's already a, like a 600,000 oh, yeah. uh, person shortage in mm -hmm. cybersecurity. Well, I was going to say Randy's always frustrated. We just don't have the mute button today. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say also, you know, we've we've mentioned several times destigmatizing mm -hmm. and, you know, we need to destigmatize coming forward and and yeah, admitting it. Yeah, yeah. We also need to destigmatize whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about so this guy, yes, destigmatize de that. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to the whole the whole press, you know, we probably have people that are from the press that watch our show. And you know, we need to destigmatize. It's okay to report on this stuff. Yeah. You know, we need to get it out there. And you know what? You might you might make somebody over at Twitter mad. Right. You know, um, there's a there's a great opportunity right now for press to have have their own business, basically. Well, so press, right? <laughs> that is a great point. I actually had a very well respected person in our industry criticize me on some of the things that I do on social media, my YouTube channel, where oh I gosh. where I profile companies uh -huh. who have been ransomware. And my answer to him was like, I, he's like, he's like, you got to watch because what if a company like that you talked about on your YouTube channel was thinking about hiring you and then they're like oh no we're not hiring him look what he said about our company when we got ransomware and i said i don't give a fuck because <laughs> like fit, right? Uh, yeah right exactly <laughs> it's not a fit system. like i i just i looked at him and i said i don't give a fuck because if they don't like what i said when they were obviously screwed up uh -huh. That's somebody who doesn't take ownership and that doesn't align with my core values they're not a fit like you need to take ownership that you screwed up right i didn't I mean, I'm just reporting what's in the news. I'm just reading a news article on my YouTube channel saying, hey, this company got hacked. Here's what happened. And I analyze it. You got upset over that because I talked about your company right. and you don't want to hire my company as a result. <laughs> you know, that that's, that's like saying, like, I don't want, um, 
you know, a professional, the, you know, right. a professional athlete who really good one, because, you know, he puts his left shoe on before his right shoe. Right. Well, right. That, that goes back to that systematic problem though. Like, like if, if you're going to get mad as a company, when somebody, you know, reports on the fact that you made a mistake, which is, you know, typically this goes back to some sort of mistake, some sort of lapse in security that caused this to happen. Uh, you're going to get mad at somebody for, for talking about that as opposed to going, yeah, we need to fix that. Then right. that's a systematic problem. So right. yeah, I agree. I, good yeah. for them. Just bringing awareness to what's going on out yeah. there. That's all we do on this show. It's all I do on my YouTube channel. I mean, and if somebody's going to get upset over me over that, they're, they're just it's the old adage of don't shoot the messenger. It, it, it's funny too. Cause it, I mean, that, that's it, that culture has kind of always been that way though. So you, you mm -hmm. go back to, uh, you know, people uh, who are vulnerability hunters and, mm -hmm. and, you know, especially in the early days of reporting vulnerabilities to like, say Google, you know, what was Google's reaction? Not thanks. Yeah. We're going to yep. fix that. It's, it's, they were trying to press charges and like pretend like the person who, who gave them that good information was hacking them. Right. We could probably, That's not how you do that. We could probably name five in the last six months yeah. that people found the vulnerability and went to, to Google or whoever. Yeah. I'm not saying necessarily Google, but they went to whoever and they were ignored. Mm -hmm. And so then they're like, I've got this vulnerability. I've got to go public with it. Which puts it in, you know, within hours, hack, hackers are going right. to use those vulnerabilities. But, so. but they have no choice because other, you know, if the big companies are just sitting on that information, that's right. You know, what, it, it, what do you got to do? And you know, we were talking about, do you do you tell like the owner? It's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it's out there and you know it's out there, do you sit there and wait for some nation state to use it against right. them? Uh, you know, it, uh, without anybody even really knowing what's going on, or do you publicly disclose it and kind of like, okay, put up or shut up now? Right. <laughs> yeah, we tried to do it the right way, but you know, you didn't act. Yeah, you've seen that sometimes where a company has known it for a long time and then like four or five months later, and is it just because you can't figure it out and you you know you can't patch it, or is it just because you don't care and it's it's on the bottom, it's you know? Convenient. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what happened with Kaseya? Didn't we end up finding out after the fact that somebody had had let them know they were aware of the vulnerability like six months prior to that? And then, you know, as soon as somebody took advantage of it, then all of a sudden they shut everything yeah. down and patched it real quick. So right. Chris did say the FBI really helped that situation. Yeah, so that, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. without getting into too many details. So, who, who yes. decrypting, right? right. Number one, this has been great being live with you guys. I had a great, obviously, two days with you. Um, and we didn't know how we were going to do this. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. totally winging this. Uh, hopefully, the audio is coming through. Otherwise, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> best show <laughs> ever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, but just to kind of wrap it up, um, you know, I do have a buddy who I briefly talked to about coming on the show. His name's Ken Pyle. He owns a cybersecurity company called Cyber. He was actually on on one of those stages at, at I think, either DEF CON or Black Hat last week. It was I think it was DEF CON because um, it happened around the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think he was at DEF CON, and he demonstrated. So what he did was um, he was able to get uh, – emergency alert system boxes oh, wow. from a electronics recycler. Uh -huh. And this is what this guy does. He's like one of the best vulnerability wow. hunters I've ever met in my life. And I was fortunate enough to go to high school and grade school with this guy. Um, and he got these boxes, he hacked them and he was able to, he was, he was able to demonstrate that I can send alerts throughout the country this is a wow. system that, that tv so stations that. yeah no. oh. so so <laughs> what so i've known about this since 2019 mm -hmm. he's he told me about this he find he's been trying to get people's attention around this for two years mm -hmm. so finally and, and look he's applied to black hat defcon multiple years mm -hmm. and they were like no no so right before defcon before this came out he was all over the news cnn was calling them everybody and they were there was massive articles about um i think it was the fcc put out an alert saying you know these you know police and emergency uh you know, whatever you want organizations yeah. need to update these systems immediately that's all and <clears throat> but this was a big deal. I mean, and he knew what he had. And I'm going to tell you right now, this guy's got more than just this. Yeah. Right. right. He, he's trying to responsibly disclose a major vulnerability with a major security product that a lot of people use. I don't use it. 
and he's not getting any traction with this either. So this is like the world that these oh, guys no, live in. Get off the show. So, <laughs> uh, but he he the cool thing about what Ken does, he's a he's kind of like a teacher at heart. He, mm -hmm. he does teach it in college cybersecurity. When he went to DEF CON, he literally showed people how to hack the system. Yeah. That's what his demonstration was. I'm going to show you how to hack this system uh -huh. right now. And you're going to be able to send a message to the emergency right. alert system doing what I show you. And he demonstrated it and did it. And it was a big deal. I mean, it was all over the news and everything. And um, this is how he had to get it out. Right. Right. <clears throat> but he's had it for two years. Holy Could moly. you imagine if it wasn't Ken and yeah. it was? Yeah. Right. A foreign actor right. or something like that. And so that stuff happens every day too. The other thing though that scares me about this story, like yeah, that obviously scares me, but the fact that he was getting this equipment in order to discover these vulnerabilities right. from an electronic right. recycling. So he wouldn't tell that me. He crap. wouldn't tell me where he got it. Right. And then in the news article came out uh, on CNN, and I think I read a CNN article, and it said he got. It, and I messaged him. I'm like, dude, an electronics recycler? Right. Like seriously? Right. And. Yeah, I mean, we, we use electronic re recyclers for for equipment. We 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 will destroy the data before it gets to them. But but still, I mean, if something like that, you know, now, now like we need to really vet those electronics recyclers even more. Right. Too. So, but like, think about it. If you're a ambulance, a small little ambulance, yeah. you know, in a podunk town, you don't have a huge budget, mm -hmm. and you don't have awareness, right? You're not working with right. a cybersecurity company. Oh, this old EAS system. We're just going to throw it in the trash. Right. Scary. You know what I mean? So, anything else you guys want to talk about today? I think Man, you did a great stuff. job. Yep. Can't wait to ask yeah. you about that security product uh, once the show's over. Yeah. Yeah. Can you sing the song real quick? Can you sing, uh, tell us something new together? Just, uh, just uh, <laughs> I don't know the words. I am not singing this morning. But. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. We'll wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Share our show. Thanks for, uh, uh, we appreciate Chris coming to Charlotte and talking to us. That was really cool. And uh, please share our show. Help us spread the word. Help us get this out. And we'll see you in the next episode. Take care, everyone. Somebody's got to walk, walk over and turn it right. off. We'll have to edit. I don't think we edit.